Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the studio sessions two. I am Kibro from Art Logbook, and together we I have three amazing content creators. Uh, I have Daisy from Dissect Architecture. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> and we have Bianca from Art Diary. Hi. And Talene from the Holistic Architect. Hi everyone. Yeah, uh, together the four of us has created a wonderful studio session series, and today is the second session, and we just jump straight into the slides. I think we give it a couple of moments where everybody can come and trickle into this particular stream. And if you are here, let us know where you're where you're from, where you're based in, and what are the events you have attended today. Yeah, let's like prepare the slides. Hey. Hello, Olafaki. How are you? Yeah, I think day two has been quite a journey so far. They started with Ines's uh, session on uh, Awaken Your Potential and A Catalyst for Change. I thought that was very interesting and inspiring. Mm -hmm. Following that, they had the Day in the Life, which was a film premiere. I think it was documented really nicely in a video format. And after that, I think there was a session by Reba Architects. So right now, we are almost in the midway point of this, the day two. Okay, you see like 20 of you are watching, so I'm just going to get started. Yeah, uh, Ken just says, yeah, he's watching from Maryland. <laughs> nice. Oh, wow, you got up early. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is quite early, I guess. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Okay, let's get started. I will just remo remove my fellow <laughs> creators. All right, so today we are going through two aspects of design. I think in the first session, we have gone through case study research and systems thinking. And today we're gonna continue the input session. Sorry. Yes, so the agenda for today is uh, I'll be going through the building design considerations. Uh, and after that, we will go through the messing and design workflows in Rhino. They'll be done by Daisy. So the objective of this session is actually to go through the integrated design process and workflow for architectural design, and also to employ uh, detailed uh, technical and building regulations, holistic considerations into our design proposals. So not only things that we learn in school, but also to consider the real world considerations and also to explore new methods of form finding in Rhino, the modeling helpers, as well as the command and interface. And lastly, to just learn from one another. All right, without further ado, I'll just jump right into it. So I'm Gabriel, I'm a Singapore architectural designer. I am also the founder of Art Logbook on Instagram and also the Art, uh, Art Loggers founder as well, which is a new membership program that we're going to start very soon that will be to increase the clarity and confidence of architectural designers. And I'm also the co-founder of the Mac Collective. So in this section, we would like to understand what is the difference between site planning and building design and, and also the various design aspects design elements and factors to consider in designing such a proposal. And lastly, to see what other considerations that might be in play in our design proposals. So if you recall from session one, uh, what Bianca from Art Dairy did was actually to highlight a, few, uh, a case study, a process that we did to decide the design factors, the design elements, and the design outcomes. So these three aspects will come in handy today as I explain uh, the several design factors, elements and outcomes that can be related to building, reg building regulations as well as the technical side of things. Yep. Also from the previous slide, we, we actually did go through the various design factors such as the building plan, the section, elevation, the, even the, the building cubicle extends, the height, the, and also the area. 
These are called design factors. And then following which we also went through the design elements such as the form and massing, light and shadow, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these uh, things to consider will come in handy today. So what is site planning and building design? To break it down, we consider two different scales of the design. The first scale is the urban scale, where we consider the street between buildings, as well as the overall site itself. That means we were not looking at within the building, we're looking around the building and maybe at the most, the building height and the building footprint. And then if a building design, you're looking at the building itself. So within the building, there are several aspects of the, the design, such as the circulation, the program, cores, as well as the services within the building itself and many other things. Jumping into the aspects of site planning and building design. So firstly, we have the building parameters. So we start off as the building, it becomes the design element. So the building itself has certain parameters such as the parameter, the area, the height, setback, and facade. Some of the constraints that might be considered at this point in time, especially for site planning, is the building height limit, the cross floor area, the setback requirements from the road and other buildings. Next, we have the cores. So cores are the functional and structural pillars of the building, consisting of staircases, to uh, toilets, risers for M&E services, etc. So these programs are usually clustered together to form a structural element, uh, usually uh, at the center or maybe at the corners of the building to better support the structure of the floor plates. And it's spaced out to also allow for easy access of the services. Next, we also have the program and circulation. So when you're considering a design of the building, we are also thinking about what are the programs that we are considering, such as the type of programs, the scale of the programs, as well as the adjacencies. So in a real world situation, we think about to place the course first, and then afterwards we would think about how to place the certain activity spaces uh, interspersed among the course. The idea is for the course to be easily accessible for example, for fire safety, which I'll mention later. For circulation, there's also a few aspects. So thinking about design factors such as the direction of circulation, the magnitude of circulation, that means how many people are walking along that path. And we're also considering the origin and destination of that group itself. So this also depends on the program. So that's why I placed program and circulation in the same slide as they intertwine very intricately. Also to consider this is the horizontal circulation as well as the vertical circulation, such as lifts and escalators. So in terms of fire safety, this is one, one topic that I myself didn't know when I was in school. So it's really important and interesting to share this with you uh, right now as a, if you're a student. So for fire safety, there's under the fire code, it's one of the building regulations. So the building regulations which I will touch on later, they are certain guidelines and key uh, laws put in place to ensure occupant safety as well as the building safety. So in terms of fire safety, there's a few aspects just at the top of my mind to share with you. Firstly is the means of escape, which is how are the occupants supposed to escape in, from the building. So imagine if you are an occupant in the building and you see where's the nearest staircase to exit from. Usually there'll be certain exit signs, for example, to guide you along the way. All this has been planned deliberately and also uh, adequately to ensure a safe passage out during a fire. So all these things are also thought of from the architect itself. So the second thing to think about is the path of travel. So how far is the nearest exit? Uh, how do they exit in the first place? And things about also the how many staircases are there in the first place because this is correlating to the occupant load. Occupant load is a calculation that we do as architects to determine the number of people in the building. So let's say if a certain program in the building requires a large number of occupants, you will need to provide more staircases and more wider staircases to escape this building. So the key concepts is to understand the placement of these uh, safety equipment or provision of escape, the adjacency and the proximity as well as the adequacy of these uh, provisions. Yep. 
Next, we have the climate. So when they think about the building design, one thing to consider is the climate. The one way to, to understand is uh, by allowing openings through a facade. Firstly, you allow ventilation. Secondly, we also allow daylighting as well as as well as the ventilation through the whole corridor, for example. And by introducing shading elements on the first, such as, as canopies and sun sheets, there will be also an additional uh, benefit to the occupants, such that there's no light going through, but wind is still going through in the, in the best scenario possible. Yeah, and then in the site context, we also have the boundaries and setbacks. So all of these uh, aspects come into play when we are doing a preliminary design. When we think about the site, there's also a boundary set in place given to us. This boundary has to be respected and met and cannot be shifted. So this boundary also will help architects understand certain buffers and certain setbacks. A setback is a offset of curves that you can generate by, from the boundary. And that space between the boundary and the new setback lines that will be the space that you cannot do certain things. For example, around the boundary, usually there'll be a two meter all round uh, setback for planting and shrubs. Firstly, is to make the, the building not too close to the road. Secondly, is to introduce new planting for a buffer between the road, public road and the private building. And yeah, there's also many other considerations such as the setback for drainage, uh, to, to make sure that we install the drainage not too close to the building and etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's a lot of different considerations with the site planning which i won't touch on today but it's also very important for architects so with regards to landscaping there are multiple types of landscapings we have trees we have shrubs uh, we have uh, grass and turfing so the different types of the uh, landscaping uh, must be understood and in introduced in the new development. There's also calculations to be involved, such as uh, replacement of landscape. So let's say if we are having a new plot of land, and then we can actually start to calculate how much land are we going to clear, how much trees are going to clear, and how much replanting are we going to introduce. So the higher this index, the better it is. So the other considerations to take note so firstly, they are also uh, the urban heat island effect. So let's say, especially within uh, the case study at Oxford Street uh, that we are doing as the participants, uh, the buildings are quite close to one another. And there's a lot of uh, spaces that could arise to this heat island effect. And secondly, the material usage of the buildings. So if we are going to redevelop the top, top shop building, for example, uh, are we going to reintroduce uh, certain new elements? Are we going to keep the facade? Are we going to rebuild something? So the amount of materials used to, to update the design is also very important. Like following which the conservation and renovation of the building uh, in the a, a situation, that means addition and alteration, uh, this is also very important. In terms of the, the cost as well as Sorry, as well as the, the the implications of the environment. If you use more concrete, for example, you, you're actually harming the environment in a way. And then moving forward, there's also the shading by greenery. We can add along the pedestrian street in our case study as well. And also introducing bicycle lanes, uh, public seating areas, uh, introducing retails. So even deciding how much of that floor area is meant for uh, commercial, retail, or even uh, bicycle parking. Architects do consider all these things as well. And lastly, the if there's any requirements from the planning authorities for the connection between buildings, that will also come to play at the very start of the design. Yeah, and touching on building regulations, so this is a topic that not many uh, schools will tell you and teach you. So I think as a student myself previously, I also was very surprised to, and also was wondering why this wasn't taught to me earlier. So the building regulations uh, may be different from the country to country. 
but the idea and the concept is the same. The idea is to, to have some guidelines and regulations to keep the occupants safe, to ensure certain sustainability objectives are met, or even to ensure maybe uh, certain costs are, are there for developers to adhere to. For example, the cross floor area. So the approved document is a document uh, in some countries like mine in Singapore, where we state certain clauses with regards to very basic uh, spatial requirements, such as headroom, like how high the building from floor to floor is the minimum for us. And also with regards to staircase design, like how high is the thread and riser of the staircase. So all of these things come into this document. And like the other documents such as fire code, even the environment, sustainability, and buildability regulations, we also have parking provisions such as how many lots are there in the car park. All these things come into play when we design a car park for the building occupants. We also have to, to consider the landscape and planting provision. So if you remove planting, we have to introduce planting, planting back somehow, may it be through a green roof or a vertical planting. And also sanitary and sewerage, drainage, all these things are things that students may not understand right now, but it's also fine. I think once you go into practice, you will understand the other m and &E services that are in play, especially in the site and building context. And lastly, if the building is near a, a road or a street or a underground uh, rail, it's also very important to understand how deep your foundations can go, for example, and not to interfere with any of the works. So in summary, the site planning and building design considerations. As architectural designers and students right now, uh, there are different aspects of considerations. So we have site constraints. This is like due to maybe the terrain of the site that will give rise to a certain constraint. Maybe, for example, to access the building, you need to have another ramp up to meet the new level. That is a site constraint. The site context is what is around the building, what's around the site, and also the building regulations, which I mentioned previously. We have the building elements like the, the facade, the plan, uh, even the height of the building. All the parameters are in play. We also have the building factors, such as maybe, for example, if you're looking into the building height as a building element, the building factor could be how high is it? Is it going to hit the maximum? Or is it going to be, can it be lower? Or can it even be underground? And also, what would this implicate in terms of the spatial experience, like the lighting and stuff like that? And also the other considerations based on the objectives mentioned in section one, like for example, if you're considering a social and economical or environmental objective. So that could be, that could influence your design proposal. Okay, so right now I have the time to pass over to this E, but if there's any questions right now about building regulations or uh, site planning, you can ask it in the comments and we'll address it later. Okay, I'll introduce, bring Daisy up now. Uh, Daisy, want to share the slides first? I'm sorry, say it again? Uh, do you want to share the slides? Uh, yes, I have to do that. Okay. Okay, yep, so I'll leave you guys with Daisy to introduce yourself first and also to bring you through the second portion of the studio session which is the messing and workflows in Rhino. All right, take it away. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, so excited to be here today. Today I'll be guiding you through messing and workflows in Rhino workshop and I'll start with a little about me. I graduated with my bachelor's of science and architecture from the University of Illinois Chicago and I'm currently working as a freelance architecture designer, so I do a little bit of everything. I'm the founder of the Dissect Architecture Platform, and I started it with the intent of dissecting different topics within the discipline of architecture. And the different topics I explore include visualization, architectural theory, construction, and software, with the hope of sharing valuable information that others can apply to their own learning and training. So in today's workshop, we'll be going over these main topics and answering these questions. 
so what is Rhinoceros City? What are the different elements of the Rhino interface? And what modeling helpers can you implement in your workflow? And which basic commands will help you and, uh, model and create your project? So let's start by going over a quick introduction to Rhino and breaking down its interface. So Rhino is a 3D modeling software that primarily focuses on surface modeling and is used by many disciplines apart from architecture, such as engineering, industrial design, and jewelry design. This is the first screen that you'll see once Rhino is open. And you can see that the Rhino interface is divided into different areas that either give you information or prompt you, the user, for information to produce a result. So we'll be exploring all these different areas and how to use them in your workflow. So the first area is the window title, which is located at the top left of the interface, and it displays the current model's name as well as the file size. Next, we have the Rhino menu, which holds most of the Rhino commands and tools and separates them by function. If you're just starting out with Rhino, this is a great area to get accustomed to and explore to get used to the interface and see how Rhino actually thinks and works. Then we have a command history window, and you'll see that this displays the previous commands we used while working. And by default, this window displays two lines at a time, but you can stretch it to display more information if needed. Um, you can also copy and paste this area, uh, the text from this area to somewhere else if you need to keep record of your work. Okay, so now we have the command prompt window, which is the area where you will type your commands. You go through the different command options and you type any information a command may ask, like distances or angles. The command prompt window has an autocomplete feature that will display uh, different commands based on the first letters you type. So after you found the command that you're looking for, you can left click the name of the command in the list to activate it. If you want to repeat the last command, you can press the enter key, the space bar, or right click anywhere in the screen to activate it once again. And this is useful if you ever click out of a command by accident. Okay, so now we have a toolbar group and sidebar, which is a collection of tab toolbars that are placed horizontally. The sidebar displays most of uh, the common use commonly used commands, and you can pull this bar to go to anywhere in the screen, or you just have it docked at the edge. If you place your cursor over any of the icons, a tooltip will appear that will tell you what the button does by displaying a small tag with the name of the command. So you'll see that the next area uh, is your viewports, and this is the area that takes up most of the interface in your screen. And you can move and resize and change the position of the viewport. A viewport will display the object, the viewport title, the background, and the grid. And while, we're, while you're working, you can either click the viewport title to make it a current viewport. You can double click the viewport title to maximize the viewport as well as return to its previous size. And you can right click the viewport title to show the viewport title menu and change any of the views in this uh, viewport. Next is the object snap control, which will display the different snap toggles that you can turn on and off as needed. And these will help you accurately model your work. Okay, and then located below that is the status bar, which shows the current coordinate system and the location of your cursor. Uh, if you ever see that the status bar is not visible on your screen, you can always press the Alt key, and this will toggle the visibility of the status bar. And the last part we'll go over is the panels. Um, these are located in the right-hand section of the screen, and you can see that these can be dragged to vote anywhere, or you can just even dock there. The panels include the different Rhino controls, like the layers option. And to select which panels are visible, you can right-click on the name of the panel to select which panels to display, and you can click through these to get used to the Rhino interface. So now that we've gotten acquainted with the Rhino interface, let's go over some of the masking helpers. So Rhino has various masking helpers to help you uh, to guide you while you're working. These will include modeling aids, deleting and selecting objects, changing object visibility, locking or unlocking objects, and layers. Let's start with the modeling aids. These are located at the very bottom of the Rhino interface, and these are the modes that you can toggle on or off, and they include the grid snap, ortho, planar, object snap, uh, smart track, gumball, court history, and filters. 
And the following slides, I'll show you a, a GIF, um, which will just depict the basic form of how to each, use each model we need. So we'll start with the grid snap, which is a modeling aid that allows you to snap to the intersection of the background grid, creating precise lines. And you can see while working that it will automatically guide your cursor to the grid. The ortho option constrains your movements to the default angle of 90 degrees as you're working. And you'll see um, when you move your cursor that it automatically guides you. And this is great if you're just working with the orthogonal line. Now, the planar modeling aid is very similar to ortho, but allows you to model objects parallel to the construction plane. And this is great to make sure that none of your objects are in different planes when they're all uh, aligned. The object snap is my most used modeling aid and lets you snap to specific lock, uh, locations in an object, like the endpoint or midpoint or the center. And you can select or deselect any of these points as you're working. Smart track is modeling aid that displays temporary reference lines and points in your Rhino viewport. And you can see that these will show up in your screen as white guiding lines and points that you can use as reference. The gumball option is a display widget that helps uh, helps you move, scale, rotate um, any objects while you're working around the gumball origin. And this is a great widget, but it does take a little bit of to get used to. The record history option, like the name suggests, records the history of a command and updates any history where objects as changes are being made. It's typically recommended to leave this option on, on off unless you're very experienced with right now. A filter is super handy and this is probably my favorite because it restricts the selection mode of a specific object to types like annotations, blocks, or curves. So if you're ever trying to delete a certain type of object, I would try to use this to just select everything at once. So now we'll go over how to delete and select objects. You can delete objects by using the delete command or the delete key. And when you're selecting an object, you'll know if an object is selected when it turns yellow. And to select more than one object, click on the first object, then hold down the shift key and click in your other object to select it. Now we'll dive deeper into object selections, and you can select multiple objects through either a crossing window or an enclosed window. A crossing window will select objects that either cross or are enclosed by the selection window. A, cross, a crossing window is created by dragging a window from right to left. The enclosed window is the opposite of the crossing window and will only select objects that are completely enclosed by the window. An enclosed window is created by dragging a window from left to right. So now we'll go over how to change the visibility of objects or locked objects. And this can be useful when you're, uh, when you're working with a large model and you want to just hide a specific part or lock a specific part of your model, but you don't want to delete it. So an object can be hidden by selecting it and using the hide command. To once again display a hidden object, you can just use the show command. Similarly, objects can be locked by using the lock command. To unlock an object, use the unlock command. And next, now we have the layers panel. So you're familiar with the CAD layering system. The Rhino layer system works very similar to it. Creating objects in different layers allows you to edit objects separately or together. You can create as many layers as you like, but be sure to keep them organized by naming them, and it's also help, helpful to assign different colors so you can differentiate between the different layers and different objects. And these can also be uh, turned off in groups or individually. So now we'll go over some of the most useful commands and how to apply them to quickly create a mass or extract curves. And we'll break them down to different categories, like creating solids, transforming a 2D curve into a 3D mass, and transforming a 3D mass into a 2D curve. In the creating solids category, we first have the box command. Uh, the box command creates a solid box like the name says, and it's, it can be handy to quickly mass an idea or concept that you might have in mind. Next is the sphere command. 
The sphere command creates a solid sphere and it works very similar to the box command. You can choose your diameter or the radius. Then we have the extrude surface command. And the extrude surface command gives thickness to a surface. It has various options like choosing the direction of the extrusion, if you like to extrude to both sides, or if you like your extrusion to be a solid. Now we'll move on into transforming 2D curves into a 3D mass category. And first we have the extrude curve command, which gives height to any curve. Uh, this will transform your line work into a surface that you can extrude to both sides, choose the height of your extrusion. Um, you can also delete any of the original line work if needed. The apply curve piping command creates a mesh pipe around the curve. And you have various options to choose from uh, with this command. You can choose the radius, the amount of segments, uh, any of the faceted options, or if you like your uh, pipe to have a cap. And then we finally have the lock command. And this creates a surface between two lines or two shapes. Uh, this command creates a surface based on the geometry of the curve. So each lofted surface will uh, vary and it'll be dependent on that geometry. In the last category, we have transforming a 3D mask into 2D curves. And we have the duplicate edge command, which duplicates the edge or the edges of an object. And I sometimes use this command a lot if I delete any of my original line work by accident and I want it back. And then the young roll surface command rolls a, a surface, an object or a closed um, poly surface into multiple planes which is great if you're setting up a file for laser cutting or if you want to print um, like a PDF for model making. Like the name says, it basically enrolls your object and assigns numbers to the enrolled edges that correspond to the different um, number edges in the 3D model. So you can reference one with the other while you're working. And the make 2D command creates the basic line drawing of a 3D model from all viewports or the viewport you're choosing. And this is a useful command that you can export. Uh, you can take the line work from this command and export it to any other software to produce your diagrams or any drawing. And then if while you're working, if you're ever stuck with a command or not sure what it does or how to work it, you can always press the F1 button to access Rhino Help or just do a quick Google search which will guide you in the right direction. And this is all just a very brief introduction into Rhino. Um, right all you can do so many things with it, has so many open possibilities. Um, but if you're ever stuck, you can just do a quick Google search, and there's usually something that, uh, that, that you can find that will guide you. So please feel free to message me if you ever need help or if you would just like to chat. And I'll just let Gabriel now guide you through the next steps of this session. Uh, can you can pitch something right now. Uh, we're still open for participants. So the basically the studio session is going to uh, end very soon so in terms of the input session. So the rest of the time is going to be spent with the participants uh, internally. So if you I have some time right now between uh, like now to the end of the session, basically what we, we are looking for are participants who are interested in go, uh, working with us to come up with a design proposal in the case study. So I think if you're interested, just uh, DM any of us and we will bring it into the Zoom call right after this. So just to have a quick idea of what the participants will be doing uh, after this uh, segment in the Zoom call. So they'll be programmed into groups and then after that, you'll come up to research and with some design statements. And afterwards, we'll pro propose some preliminary design ideas. And after that, we will also go through the, the deliverables with them. And I think we're trying to make it as not too intense of the, in the terms of production, but we want to actually drill deeper into the conceptualization of the, the proposals themselves. So not to worry if you're worried about 
the time taken to do your proposals. You'll be working with people uh, uh, other than yourselves. You'll be working with others as well as us. So that by gathering all the inputs you have learned over the two sessions, we will come up with a proposal that is uh, holistic as well as uh, well integrated. Yeah, so for the participants, uh, they'll be going through and understanding the constraints of Oxford Street and the top shop building, following which there'll be uh, guidance for them in terms of how to go to represent their ideas on a online collaborative board, as well as to get started in modeling in Rhino. So we will go through with them uh, the processes of how to model in Rhino in detail, as well as coming up with proposals and to present using 3D methods instead of doing drawings. Yeah, so in, that's all for the input session of the studios. Uh, if you like what you have heard so far, and uh, but you didn't catch certain things, don't worry, we will put all these slides available on the MacCon website after this. And if you are keen to join the, the participants, we are still have some slots available. And let me bring up the rest of the people. <laughs> yeah, so, Thank you all for just joining us in this uh, segment of the inputs. It, again, like we would really uh, like to hear from you what you will have any questions or any comments right now of the inputs from the past two days. I mean, today and the day before. Uh, if there's any questions you, uh, you thought of later on, you can always DM us, uh, especially if you want to talk about system thinking, you can approach uh, Talene's account. If you want to ask questions about case study research, you can approach a Bianca's account on Instagram and myself if you're interested in asking questions about building design and regulations and stuff like that on Art Logbook. And lastly, if you have questions about um, Rhino itself, you can also approach uh, Daisy from that architect architecture. So yeah, I think if there's no major questions, uh, don't worry, we will just, this uh, recording will be on YouTube Live and as well as the slides will be available for you to view afterwards. If anything, I'll see for the rest of you guys. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for spending time with us today. Yep. So for the 20 people watching, I think, thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you for other events. All right? Yeah. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.